I now uh, head up the Equal Skies Charter, which is our initiative to see more disabled people working within the aviation and aerospace industries because diversity needs to see people with different backgrounds coming in. They bring in different experiences, different mindsets, and if we're still talking business, it makes that business so much more resilient because with a disability, every day you need to overcome a little obstacle, something as simple as how on earth do I crack this egg or do up my buttons? And that builds a real uh, mindset of innovation, um, which in terms of business it is so valuable because disabled people don't see barriers that many other people do, which can only be beneficial in the long run. So going back to that moment then, that, that really dark time when you chose to go and see the psychologist, um, one of the things that we really talk about here on Inspirability is taking control of the situation, which, which is what you did. And you're here to tell the tale and to share it with us. Um, so perhaps maybe you can talk a little bit about that moment and what made you decide to go and see the psychologist and perhaps what you feel or what you would want someone to learn from your story? Yeah. It, so my dad had sort of called a psychologist and got her involved. At the time, I didn't really care about anything. So it was like, oh, this lady wants to chat and have a poke around in my brain and see what's wrong. And it was after a couple of sessions where something really clicked and um, and it, it became something I wanted to do. It became a highlight of the week, not because it was making me better, but because it was that interest. And um, I guess the, the moral of that is at times where you feel out of control, try and centre yourself by finding that one thing, that one reason why you want to do something, maybe that interest or, or it's good fun, just, just it's like falling down the cliff, you scrabble around and you, you find that one thing to grab onto and grab onto that, don't let it go. Um, but whilst you are scrabbling around, just trust the people who do have a bit more control than you. It's a really powerful metaphor actually, that scrabbling, climbing, falling down a cliff, finding something to hold on to. Yeah. What did you find to hold on to? Um, initially it was that, um, that interest in the uh, sessions, um, and then it was, I wanted to write about the last few months particularly, and so that's when Adam really came into my life, and we were still locked down, and we had Friday night where we chatted about the uh, the books and uh, had a drink and stuff like that over Zoom and it was just getting through to, to that. Um, but over time as I got better I realised I didn't want to tell the world that story. I just wanted to get it down on paper so that I could make a bit more sense of it. So you got it down on paper. Did you write a diary or write a journal to help you go through your thoughts? Um, I was going to write an autobiography, which 
sounds really stupid and I'll cringe when I say that. It goes to say what a bad place I was in. Um, but now it's just a few sheets of rounded in throughout different periods of my life. Are you going to write the autobiography at some point? I, I dashed it. Because you don't I do things by halves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting this. <laughs> Uh, I doubt it. Maybe if I make it to sort of 50, I will. But, but yeah, it's not on the cards at the moment. Well, if you do, I look forward to reading it because I think it's going to be incredible. And I think a lot of people will be able to learn a lot from your story and from the vulnerability that, that you've shown. How do you, because you said earlier, you know, you set yourself really high standards, you want to come first. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always work out for one reason or another. How do you then stop going from sort of beating yourself up, if you like, from not coming first to going, actually, it, it's OK and, and being kind to yourself? Uh, I think understanding the bigger picture is really great. Um, learning from others. So I have ability, there's a lot of people to learn from in terms of being chilled out about when you maybe don't meet those standards and contextualising it. Um, Realising how unimportant you are, which sounds really weird, but a lot of people believe that if they don't do something, the world's going to implode. And in terms of the earth, you are very unimportant. So looking after yourself and enjoying your life comes first. And in, your, in doing that, you, you perform to much higher standards. So I think they're sort of the three main things. I think what you just said about looking after yourself, that's uh, really, really powerful because one thing that we have talked about with other guests that goes hand in hand with that is the importance of saying no. Sometimes you can spread yourself too thinly, take on lots of things, yeah. and then you don't want to let people down. But as you just said, the world still spins without us in it. Yeah. And maybe by saying no, we're actually, we're being kinder to ourselves, but also we're, then we're not letting people down because we've not taken on something we don't have to the time to do. Yeah. So have you, is there anything you've had to say no to recently? Um, I guess in a slightly different context, I've said no to most social media. Um, so that, that's been a really big thing for me. I felt like I was just being constantly bombarded. It was just becoming a bit relentless, having people able to contact me all the time. And people I didn't know, and people seeing you know. Um, so I've come off that now. And in a weird sort of way, I feel a lot more secure within myself. So I think that's a big thing I say no to. Um, I must admit, sort of in terms of being busy, I am still quite bad at saying no. It's still a skill I need to learn. And uh, today's a important example of that. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, I think I've got a lot better in it um, when it comes to bits of work and things like that. It, it's so important to manage your time effectively so when it really does matter, you, you can perform well. It's interesting what you say about social media. I don't think we've really touched on that much on the show before. Um, but I think with social media, you can just feel so accessible to people yeah. all the time and it's really hard to switch off. And, and if you're sitting there messaging someone that's messaged you, but you've got family, you're, you're not really being present with your family no. that are there when you're at the meal table with them, but you're messaging someone who's sent you a message. Um, so how have, you, how have you found it's changed your life being off social media or your relationships maybe with your family? It just feels a lot more secure, um, a lot more relaxed and a lot more personal. Um, so 
when I go out and see friends, it, it's just, it's chatting, it's not scrolling through phones. Um, and sort of tying into that, you bring up relationships with that family. That's something with my immediate family I always struggled through, well, with throughout life. Um, but moving down to Portsmouth and taking that time to really get to know myself, the, those relationships are now fixed. Uh, they're much more manageable, um, which 10 years ago, if you had asked me, I would have told you I wouldn't be talking to my parents in 10 years. Um, so that's a really special thing. And what do you think's been the catalyst for that change in the relationship between you and your family? Positivity, I would say. I think... Um, I am very different even now to my family. I would say in a lot of ways I'm very chilled out, quite positive about things, um, whereas they're slightly different. And I think that creates uh, clashes occasionally. Um, but taking that time, as I said, in Portsmouth to learn myself and prove that a lot of things that I would sort of couldn't do or actually can had just built that resilience so I'm able to be open to a relationship with, with my parents, which is fantastic. And we touched earlier on about um, your relationships with the staff and the team at Airability, the Airability family. Yeah. So tell me about your journey with Airability because you've gone from being a student with Airability to a member of staff. So tell me a bit about that and what you now do. Um, yeah, so it's came here um, and I think more or less at the same time I started flying here, I started volunteering here because I just wanted to be around the place and I'm a big believer in what you take out, you've got to put back in for others, and a bit more. Um, so started volunteering here, and then I was quite happy with that. Um, and then the job for Aviation Activities Officer came up, which I was never going to apply for because I simply wasn't good enough to do it. And then Maya, my mum text with the job I bet, and I said, no, I'm not applying. My dad texts with it, and I said, no, not applying. Someone else texts, and um, I think it was my, my uncle, Aaron, who texted me about 11 at night when I was in bed. And um, I've always sort of looked up to him. Um, and so I thought, well, we'll give it a go. And uh, that, that's what started this journey. So it started part-time, went full-time, all the time, taking on a bit more responsibility. Um, and also learning along the way, sort of. I started here as a kid. I've been here my entire adult life. Um, so it's really cool to have that support network around to have known you for so long and enjoy seeing you progress. Um, but the biggest progression was earlier this year, so I now uh, head up the Equal Skies Charter, uh, which is our initiative to see more disabled people working within the aviation and aerospace industries. And by putting that knowledge in, we hope that it will improve the experiences for passengers with disabilities. So a really positive thing to be doing, I think. And an incredible step from the Harvey that said, no, I'm absolutely not applying for that role. No, I'm not good enough. <laughs> to what an incredible achievement. 
So one of the things we talk about quite a bit is imposter syndrome. Um, you know, that feeling of, no, 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 I'm not good enough. But, you know, someone's seen something in you to offer the, you those jobs, but even if you don't see it within yourself. Yeah. So just talk to me a bit about that process of how you manage to have the confidence, the self-belief, to find that to apply to, to that job that you'd originally said, I can't do that. Well, originally it was just send in my CV in because I never believed I would actually get the job. But I think the past few years have just really felt imposter syndrome because I've spent my time surrounded by such a talented team. But it's just, I think, about learning your differences to other people. Um, the biggest thing I've had to get over being here is actually collaboration. Um, sort of growing up as a disabled person, you sort of get help from other people and they end up getting most of the praise for it. So you sort of learn if I want to be seen to be doing good things, I have to go it alone. So I know that Mummy the Smith and a few others here have like, tried really hard to sort of rewire that bit on the brain. And I think it's only really been this year I've learned how powerful collaboration can be because we're, we're the big tasks that we get here, you're never going to be able to do it on your own. And letting other people help, it is very rarely a bad thing in business terms. It, it usually can only be helpful. How would you advise anybody who's, um, who's used to doing things by themselves? Like, you know, you said you were. How would you advise them to then go about actually asking for help? Well, it's going to be very difficult. Um, a big part of it initially is being very careful about who you ask for help. Um, in terms, not personally, but in terms of going about work. But give it a go. Like the more positive experience you have in that area, the more natural it will become. Yeah, you sort of open up a little bit yeah. and then, oh, that's okay. I'll open up a bit more and I'll, you know, just is that step by step, isn't it, into that, into that's that outside of that comfort zone, to yeah. building a bigger, bigger comfort zone. Yeah. So we touched earlier on, on the Equal Skies Charter and diversity. Uh, so tell me, first of all, what, why do you think diversity is important? Well, what, what's comforting, and I always start off with this, um, I'm not a big person. If diversity wasn't important, I wouldn't talk about it. Um, but it, it really is. Um, because diversity leads to people with different backgrounds coming in, they bring in different experiences, different mindsets. And if we're still talking business, it makes that business so much more resilient and so much more agile. With a disability, every day you need to overcome a little obstacle, whether that's sort of how to get from one place to another, or something as simple as how on earth do I crack this egg or do up my buttons? And that builds a real uh, mindset of innovation, um, which in terms of business is, is so valuable. And quite often because of, because disabled people might struggle with stuff, might not have resources, they don't see barriers that many other people do, which can only be beneficial in the long run. So in terms of exploring other opportunities outside of um, aerobility, aerobility then 
helped you then get an opportunity with Nats. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your work with Nats. Yeah, so Nats is a huge supporter of ours. And in uh, 2022, at the back end of that, I ended up being offered a secondment down there, which was an opportunity I was quite keen to take just because I had been at availability for sort of my whole adult life. So I thought it would be quite beneficial to go um, and see a different organisation. And there I learned so much. So how to communicate with people uh, effectively. Um, because they have a big organisation, it's all about collaborating. So I think that was a real icing on the cake for me to sort of overcome that fear of asking for help. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity. And you also um, instruct uh, horse riding as well, I believe. I used to, say, yeah. So um, that really made up uh, 10 years of my life. Uh, so I started it at the uh, request of a, or the suggestion of a physio, said it would be quite good. Um, and I intended to go along for one session and then say, right, we tried it, I'm not going back. Um, but I got dragged into it a little bit and um, after a bit of time I um, started volunteering there. Um, and as I mentioned, I was very sporty back in the day, so I tied it in with my A-level in PE, um, and that allowed me to become a horse riding instructor. Um, but the thing I really loved is awards competing. Uh, so I was able to compete at the Nationals a few times. Um, really enjoyed just challenging myself and challenging others on that equal level. But obviously my favourite part of that entire journey was teaching. Um, and because I was one of the more able people that come through, a lot of people um, I was teaching um, had sort of life-limiting illnesses and disabilities or, or they were less cognitively able to, to be able to put them on a horse and make them smile um, and laugh what was a real great sort of sense of achievement. I, I, I think I benefited from these sessions as much as they did. And then to also, on the flip side, teach people who were similar to me and really wanted to be able to learn how to ride a horse well, I also had that mixed in. So it was a fantastic way to spend my time when I didn't have a job. What's incredible about your story that I'm hearing all throughout is that you go to a horse riding lesson and then become an instructor, you do um, a trial flight with AirAbility and then you end up really working for AirAbility and being part of the Equal Skies Charter or you, and then end up working for Nats. So there's all these opportunities that you've been embracing, it's, it's so powerful to, to hear. So what would you say to the Harvey who got off the aeroplane uh, in Livingston, ended up going to Forty Towers in Livingston. Um, what would you say to him if you could go back in time about embracing opportunities? Uh, yeah, exactly that. I think carry on taking chances because I haven't planned any of this. It's, I think when I was younger, I could see myself working in a shop for the rest of my life. It's just by saying yes to things that things happen. And I think that's the golden rule. Just always say yes. Within reason. <laughs> and in addition to all of that, you now 
are a budding stand-up comedian. So tell me a bit about your career in comedy. Uh, well, that's sorry I have a bit of to you. So, um, say, I, I've done a few funny things over the course of my life. Um, I'm not sort of yet normal person. I find myself in very strange situations. And um, it was my co-inner CFI here who took me along, or was going to take me along to my first comedy night in Petersfield. And uh, he ended up not going. I decided to go on my own. And I sort of fell into the stand-up comedy. So the evening after that was my uh, first gig in Portsmouth. Um, but it goes back to finding something positive. Um, one thing I don't really mention is, as a kid, I was very creative. My dream job was to uh, be a singer, uh, like Freddie Mercury. This was before I knew I had a funny voice. I spent a long time not actually knowing that. And so, to be able to be doing something creative, but also making people laugh, was something extra to do in the day, but it was something positive and it helped me relax. i tell you, it shows great courage as well because I don't think I could be a stand-up comedian. I mean, I'm not funny, but I wouldn't have the courage or the bravery. To... It can be hard work sometimes. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you don't always get it right. So talking a bit about the um, the future then, aside from your career in stand-up comedy, um, what is next for Harvey? Well, who knows? It's um, because, as I said, I haven't planned any of this and it's turned out pretty well so far. Over the past few years, or when I've been exploring um, sort of my inner self, as it were, um, I've realised that a few of my dreams to do with personal life are probably unlikely to become true just because of the way I, I choose to live my life. It isn't always conducive to the standard way of living. But I think that it's going to be a lot more positive. I've uh, got to try and keep these support networks going as long as I can and uh, just carry on blagging it for as long as I possibly can. And what do you hope anybody listening to your remarkable story will take away from it about taking control of their life, moving forwards and you know, embracing every opportunity like, like you have? I think... It all stems back to knowing yourself, know yourself, do what's right for you. And in doing that, you will be happier. You'll be able to do what's right for other people. But just take chances. Not everything's going to work out, but that's OK, because something will turn out for the best. And you never know. Well, Harvey, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today, for opening up and the the vulnerability and, and honesty that, that you've shown, uh, because it's something that, that I think will resonate with so many of our viewers and listeners. So, uh, so thank you. And um, I'm really excited to see about the rest of the work that you do with Inspirability and Airability. So thank you for being with us today. And I look forward to what the next chapter brings. Thank you for having me. It's been, been a pleasure.